Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanted to open up our meeting today in 1 Samuel chapter 30. <clears throat> and I wanted to draw a contrast as David being a type of Christ to the Amalekites being a type of the enemy or Satan and show what kind of masters they both are and how it pertains to our salvation. So I'm going to be going through um, chapter 30. I'm going to start in verses 1 through 4. It says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, and the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, <clears throat> and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Now the Amalekites had burned the city and taken all the people. And um, I was reminded that in the beginning, when Satan deceived Eve and she ate of the fruit, he had um, burned up our nature, so to speak, so that it was left in ruins. And he carried all mankind away as captives. Now, the Amalekites did not kill the people, though, which you would have thought they would have. <laughs> but God was preserving them to be returned to their rightful owners. Man surely died the day the fruit was eaten, but Satan was not allowed to kill us himself. People of God are still alive and haven't been overtaken by the enemy because God is preserving us for Christ. We do have a real enemy, and he really could take us out on a one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. battle. But God will not allow him to go past a certain point. And we learn this from, like, when we read about in Job, how there was, there was limitations um, set upon Satan. He could only work within a certain circumference. And he wasn't allowed to go any farther than that. In 7 and 8, it says, And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. David inquiring of the Lord reminded me of Jesus praying to the Father before he went to his passion. Before Jesus fought the hardest battle of his earthly life, he went to his Father first and asked if it were possible to let that cup pass from him. But if the cup may not pass away from him unless he drink it, then the God's will be done. 11 through 13 well, I'm going to start in 9. It says, So David went, he and 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Bezor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint they could not go over the book Bezor, brook Bezor. And they, and they found an Egyptian in the field, and brought him to David, and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him to drink water. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, the spirit came again to him. For he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me, because three days agone I fell sick. Now, this is a demonstration of what kind of master Satan is. He has no care for his slaves. Uh -huh. He has no allies. He uses a slave as much as he can, but if and when they wear out or they become sick <clears throat> and they are no longer useful to furthering his own agenda, Satan will toss them aside to die without so much as a thought of their well-being. The Amalekite master doesn't even leave provisions of hope for this weak sick slave, peradventure he might get well on his own. He just leaves him there to die. <clears throat> it's contrary to, the sa to nature's Satan. 
It's contrary to Satan's nature to be kind like that. Nor does Satan find some kind of satisfaction in even leaving the slave. He did not take any thought for him. He doesn't, I don't mean for this to sound funny, but Satan doesn't do like a victory um, dance or, or something like that when, when his cruelty has paid off in some manner. He just moves on with no further thought of that poor soul that he just injured. And he just finds another avenue to, to express himself. But we notice how David treats this Egyptian slave. He, along with his men, are physically exhausted. They just got back three days' journey from this, uh, back to Ziklag and found it burnt, and then took off to go after the Amalekites. So they are exhausted themselves. And they're, um, on top of that, they're, emotionally exhausted because their families have all just been taken as well mm -hmm. but they take time to to help this man and and they feed him david displays kindness and compassion and looks upon the needs of another and his kindness um, that david showed um, led to him being able to receive this critical information about where the amalekites were and this and this servant mm -hmm shows them where they were going. Um, back in 16, it says, And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight, even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, mm -hmm. and David rescued his two wives. Yeah. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all, mm -hmm. and David took all the flocks and all the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. Now we see here that David recovered everything that was lost. He restored all that was taken. And not only that, he spoiled the Amalekites so that he came out with more than what they had to start with. Again, we see this as a type of Christ. And where sin had abounded, grace did much more abound. In Colossians 2, 13 through 15, it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Amen. John 17, um, Jesus, when he was praying, he said he had not lost any when he was praying to the Father, save the son of perdition that the scriptures may be fulfilled. They were kept, and now Jesus is bringing even more sons to glory. Jesus emptied himself when he came to this world to seek and save the, that which was lost, but he's not empty anymore, mm -hmm. and he didn't leave empty-handed. Yeah. He's bringing home the spoils. Amen. For he hath put all things under his feet, and God hath all also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. I wanted to look at this 21 through 24. It says in day, because we, we don't want to forget those 200 men that were left behind for a, for a short time. It said, And when David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook of Bezor, and they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. They answered all the wicked men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them out of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren. With that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our land. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff 
they shall part alike. And so we do remember those 200 men that were just not able to go with David to the battle. They were too faint. It wasn't because these men were um, half-hearted or just didn't want it bad enough. That, that's not why they stayed behind. They were, they were men of battle. The city was burnt. Their goods had been stolen. Their families were taken captive. And if there was ever a time to fight, this would have been it. But because of their frame, they were held back. The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. That's how we could put that circumstance there. Well, in the end, David divides the spoil with them, knowing that ultimately the Lord was the one that gave them the victory. And secondly, the men did stay with the stuff. (laughs) It wasn't as glamorous, I guess to say, as being on the battlefield, but those men did have a part in keeping what they had until David and the other men returned from the battle. Sometimes in our spiritual walk with the Lord, there are times that we're strong enough to go in and take down the enemy. And then there are times because of our frame that we are left to guard the stuff, so to speak. To hold on to what we've got and to make sure it isn't stolen. In either case, there was a function for both positions here. And God also sets us in the body where it pleases him. When it comes down to it, we didn't deserve anything from the Lord that would have been beneficial to us, what we deserved compared to what we are getting now. But God is good, and he saw fit to make us a people that he could show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. In both positions, we are humbled by the mercy and goodness that God has shown to us. And... um. I'm sure you guys already thought about this, but in Isaiah 53, 12, dividing the spoil, it says, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Um, so I wanted to bring out that even though these men weren't um, physically strong enough to go into that, ba- that battle, it wasn't that they were weak-minded. They wanted to go, but they couldn't because of their frame. So they were strong. They were men of battle, and they got their share of the spoil. Christ, who is our captain, has gone in, and he is one, and he is sharing. He is dividing the spoil. John 10.10 10 says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The Lord didn't just bring us back to the garden. He's taking us all the way to the throne of God. See, when they went in, they recovered their stuff, but they also recovered more. They, got, they spoiled the enemy. And so this morning as we open our meeting, I wanted to remind us that how Jesus has already won this battle, and he's looking for those who he can divide the spoil with. Today, look for the rich blessing that he has won and brought to us. Um, I want to close with Ephesians 4. It says, when he ascended up on high... He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Amen. Amen. Brother uh, Robert has our class today, so we'll open with our, a prayer for him.